when I talk about the subject that we're talking about, and we're going to continue on today, I, I want to just turn it down just a little bit, will you? I want to, thanks, that, that's much better. I want to, um, I'm going to say the word disclaimer. That's not quite what I mean, but it's the best that I can do. And that is this. Uh, my experience in talking about what we're talking about is I get met with a fair amount of resistance and skepticism, and I understand that. Because basically what we've been taught for quite a while, and uh, it's almost just instinctively believed, is this. That you either have a hierarchical form of government and relationship, which we even carry into the home, uh, which is my main concern, even though I talk about these other things in organizational levels and what happens in heaven, my main concern is what happens in the home. That we feel like that we either have a hierarchical relationship and people use verses to prove that. But you know what? If I took you back 150 years, 100, 180 years, 200 years, people use the Bible to uphold and prove slavery. People use the Bible to prove and uphold all kinds of things. Doesn't make it right. Do you understand what I'm saying? So people often view that we either have hierarchical form of government or we have chaos. Because if you don't have a hierarchical form of government, the only alternative you have is chaos. And primarily we have bought into that thinking. It's just not true. It's a lie. Because to say we only have hierarchical form of government is to make the statement that we need this hierarchical relationship or hierarchical uh, authority to have order. And if we don't have that, what we're going to do is spin off into chaos where there is no order. But guys, both sides are wrong. Don't get caught in the debate. Both sides are wrong. Because what God presents in his word is self-government. I mean, is the only reason you don't steal is because the policeman might be on the other aisle watching you? See, that's hierarchy, and that's hierarchical thinking. Or I spin off into, hey, the electricity went off. Let's just take whatever we can take. And I'm going to suggest to you, when you listen to the news, you're either only going to get stories of chaos and pictures of chaos, or you're going to get stories of a need for a hierarchy. But you're not going to see a, a big group of stories representing many people who are self-governing, who aren't stealing because they know that's not right. And the reason why you're not going to get that is because if we have hierarchy, Lucifer can control. If I have chaos, Lucifer can control. But Lucifer cannot control in self-government. That is an impossibility. And you say, well, Dean, that's absolutely not true. I, I mean, how, how can you possibly say that Lucifer could not control in self-government? Because there's only one way in the world you can have self-government. 
And that is where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the only way you'll ever have self-government is if the Spirit of the living God lives in you. And if the Spirit of the living God lives in you, Lucifer cannot control. And God gives you the freedom for self-government. God gives you the freedom for self-actualization. God gives you the freedom of choice. And the one thing that God will never, ever, ever do, which is what Lucifer continually accuses him of, is that God will enslave you and cross your conscience of decision and choice. And God pledged on the cross that he would never do that. He will never cross your choice. That's why the element of force never appears in the kingdom of God ever. And God portrays himself as a shepherd, as as a caregiver, as a tender tender person, and in the most uh, outstanding ways, God portrays himself as a lover. And a lover never uses force or they become a rapist. Pardon my strength of language. And that's how important that dividing line is. Do you see the difference between those two? And God portrays himself as continually appealing. And the Bible would even use the word wooing and inviting. Come unto me, whosoever believes. For the God so loved the world... You see, those are all the terminologies that are used. Does that make sense? So, my disclaimer is, when you listen to me talk about hierarchy, please don't walk away saying Dean is an anarchist who believes in chaos. You don't hear me much talking about chaos. Uh, But chaos is a form of government. It is the absolute worst form of government. Better to have a hierarchy than to have chaos. And the Bible makes that clear. You say, how do you know that? You just need to study and find the flood. And the cause of the flood was chaos. And then after the flood, the very first form of government you see established and talked about in a civil way is Nimrod, which is a dictatorship. But the dictatorship of Nimrod didn't end in a flood. It was chaos that ended in the flood. But I'm not spending time there, because the Bible is mainly from Revelation chapter 12 and 13 that we preach continually, and we should, portrays the world moving towards hierarchy. You don't get universal death decrees without a hierarchy. That doesn't happen. You don't get a universal demand to control worship without a hierarchy. That's why I'm mostly functioning and talking about hierarchy because that is the current, present direction we're headed. Does that make sense? When I talk about hierarchy and I deal with this, I know it can be misunderstood in that Never think ever that I'm putting on an equality God and man. God will always be God. God will never, we can never find a place where God had a beginning. Because a beginning demands a creator. Right? God is self-existent. Life within himself, I cannot explain that. It goes way beyond my thinking, but I believe that. I will always be a created being. Always. You will always be a created being. 
That will never change. Even in salvation, you're a created being. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And you come to the New Testament that says that in Christ we are new creatures. The, the most plain verse on the plan of salvation is, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created unto good works, which Christ hath before appointed or laid out. That relationship will never change. And you say, well, Dean, right, you've just, just sat down and be quiet because you just said, then there's the hierarchy. Father, son, equal, then man. And that's the, what's proving everything else. So you just need to sit down. And I'm saying, okay, certainly. But I think before I sit down, let's just be sure we're understanding the words of Jesus because I'm not going to disagree with that. Right? You find me the verse where Jesus upholds a hierarchical relationship between himself and you. You find that verse for me in the Bible, and I will sit down. But Jesus says, you say, you call me, this is what you're saying, you call me Lord and Master. Okay, you do well but I am one that came to serve. And if you go to John, one of the most powerful chapters speaking of the relationship between us and God, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. You can't get any closer connection than that. Vine and branches. And then he says, without me, you can do nothing. And then, one of the, to me, one of the most profound verses in all the Bible, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, the most profound verse in the Bible is, Jesus says, I call you friend. Friend. Do you want to disagree with that and say, oh, no, God, you're not friend, you're king. Woe be to you to see that's, when Jesus, that's what Peter was saying. Because, see, it's a human that's subject to death. God is not subject to death. And when Jesus said, I'm subject to death, think of the implications of that. And Peter says, far be it from you, that cannot happen. And Jesus so much put a stop to that, he said, you're Lucifer. That's the words of Lucifer. It is the words of Lucifer to deny the fact that our Lord and Savior became man, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, even to the subject of death the cross. It's Luciferian philosophies that would deny that. Do, do you understand what's taking place? Friend. And man, if, I don't, if you don't get anything else I say, get this, guys. There's no power on earth or in heaven that it does that except God. Calls us friend. And then the second most powerful statement. I call you friend. And a man, no greater love is given than a man would lay down his life for a friend. That, that, that is mind-boggling to me. 
and anything that would try to change or paint a different picture in our mind of the relationship that God wants to have, guys, we've got to resist it. We've got to resist it. <clears throat> to the point you say, well, yeah, for certainly everybody in heaven is Jesus' friend. That's absolutely not true. Jesus goes to the wedding feast. The father comes into the wedding feast and he's looking around, Matthew chapter 21, I think it is. He's looking around and he sees somebody sitting there without a wedding garment on. What, how does he address him? Do you remember? Yeah, that's ultimately what happens. But how does he address him? God walks up to him and says, friend. How is it that you came in here without a wedding garment on? The people we despise who would strap a bomb to themselves, go out into the marketplace, pull the cord, 50 people dead. You hear it every day on the news. We would despise that. When God comes to them at the end, do you know what he's going to say to them? Friend. Friend. How, how did this happen? Our Savior is a friend to mankind, linked permanently, never to be separated. And when you go into heaven and you fall on your knees and you say, God, how is this possible? He's going to lift you up on your feet and say, friend, friend, be with me. Do you understand? That does away with that. And I'm telling you, don't t guys, don't take it as a happy day when your wife introduces you to the people around and says, oh, this is David. He's my head. <laughs> he rules our home. I would not take that as a compliment. What I would take as a compliment is that my wife said, this is David. He's been the best friend I've ever had. You could live with it, couldn't you? And what hierarchy wants to do is establish a relationship between all of us that demands that one of us is ahead of another, hierarchically all the way down, to wipe out the concept, why are we here together? Because we're friends. Because we love each other. Because we trust each other. Because I know that I can be here and this is my family. That's what God is wanting to give us and that's what is wanting to be taken away from us because people who see this see if we don't have this, all we're going to have is chaos. And here's what I've understood in my home. The more I've established headship in my home, the more chaotic it has gotten. And the more that Gail and I have become friends and truly appreciate, the more stable and smoothly our home functions. When I view her as equal partner and she views me as equal partner and we work together harmoniously, our home is the most stable and our children the most happy. And believe it or not, I've tried it the other way. And I'm speaking for me because there's been times when Gail's tried to be the head of the home. And you know what? That didn't work so well either. It did not work so well. So I hope that my disclaimer, just a few minutes I took my disclaimer, is going to help clear things up. I'm not trying to do with the relationship, deal, do away with the relationship between God and man. I am trying to give a biblical portrayal of what that relationship will look like. Uh, where I'm going to start today is just where we left off of why do we need a reformation, and then I'm going to deal with the, the reformers. 
So I'm going to start in Acts. Acts chapter 20. Uh, You should read the whole passage, but I'm going to just start in verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's interesting. I mean, you know this. You see it? I just want us to just be sure we're not missing this. Who owns the church? And why does he own the church? Because he bought it. He purchased it with his blood. He came back and paid the whole bill. For I know this, Paul says, I know this, that after my departure, meaning his death, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, where? From among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. What you ought to do is connect that right there with Philippians where Paul says, let nothing be done through vain conceit. Because that's exactly what happened. Because they left the upper room united and the Spirit of God led the way and we saw take place what the world had never witnessed before. But it will witness again. What we are promised is that before the end there will be an army from God that will march through this earth with banners unfurled and nothing will be able to stop it. And that will be the last proclamation of the love of God and last invitation delivered to planet Earth. And then it will end. From among your own selves, men will sp- speak perverse things. Now, I, I, man, I could go on for days on this. But I just don't have that. You don't have that. But I just want to give a couple of examples what that means. So I'll give you an example, an illustration. So I got to get be sure I'm saying it rightly. There is a word called Pelagianism. It is P L A G I A N I S M. Pelagianism. And what that is, is Pelagius had a theory. He was a believer in Christ. But his theory was that yes, we are saved through faith plus our works. That became Pelagianism. Really, that was no more than what was happening in Galatia, right? Where Paul says we're saved by grace alone. And you've turned to this other gospel, which was saved by Christ plus circumcision. Saved by Christ plus saved by... You've got that point. Well, that ultimately develops into Pelagianism. Do you have that point? Now, that was in contrast to the Augustinian theory that we're saved by grace alone. Now, before you jump all over that and say, hey, that's where I'm at, I'm with Augustine. Well, maybe you are, because he certainly was for all of this. Because Augustine's theory of saved by grace alone was built on the cornerstone of you have no free will. That you are saved by grace alone, but that's God's choice. And he's chosen to save Marquita, but too bad for you, David. 
and she can live like the devil and she's still going to heaven and you can live like God and you're not going to heaven. Because you have no free choice. Which ultimately out of that teaching flows the concept of once saved, always saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? So a war begins to take place in the church between the Augustinian theory and Pelagianism and that theory. And guess what? Lucifer doesn't care which one wins. Why? And, all, and get this point, everything I'm saying is illustrating. Get out of the debates. Mostly the debates and arguments that are being offered to you to decide on. Somebody has skillfully crafted those things and both choices offered you are wrong choices. But you feel like there's nothing you can do, so the best you can do is to take the, the worst of the two evils. Have you ever heard that kind of thinking? When you are faced with a choice that I must choose between the worst of two evils, the devil is seeking to control your choice. You never have to choose the worst of two evils. You can choose the best. You can choose the Lord Jesus Christ. And Pelagianism was wrong. Augustinianism was wrong. What was right? What was right is this. I'm saved by grace alone. Through Christ, Christ alone, period, zero. Don't let another thought come. And I have free choice. And past that, leave it alone. Or you will think yourself into a false camp. I can't explain the plan of salvation. I can only accept what the Bible says or reject what the Bible says. You can't explain how there's a relationship between a sovereign God and clay. And clay has free choice, and yet I'm still clay. You can't explain that. I don't have to explain it. And the reason I don't have to explain it is because my best example of free choice is a man, a God who became a man, free choice, and hung on a cross and said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That cross establishes my free choice for an eternity. Both men were wrong. Why did they do what they were doing? Now, I'm going to be a little harsher than anything you're going to read in these books, which probably isn't the best. <clears throat> and I'll explain what the book says, but I'm going to tell you why I think those guys did what they did. Because they were leading men after themselves. It wasn't enough to work and be a leader and to be a brother in the church. It wasn't enough. They wanted to lead a following after them. And how do I know that was taking place? Because the book of 1 Corinthians is written about that whole concept. All you have to do is read the first two chapters where Paul says, you guys are carnal. One of you says you're of a Paul. One of you says you're of Apollos. One of you says you're a Cephas. See, that's all starting right there. Trying to get these guys to lead people, be the leader. Oh, hey, I'm a follower of Morris Vinden. Oh, no, I'm a follower of this. If that's where you're at, you're carnal. You're still dead in your sin. Paul's ultimate cry is, did I die for you? Did Apollos die for you? Did Peter die for you? Who died for you? Lord Jesus Christ, then let his name be proclaimed. Both sides would be wrong. Does that make sense? Am I being too strong? <clears throat> so 
So, perverse things. By the way, between Augustinian theory, even though that's the theory, how many of you have heard of Augustinian? Now, see, everybody's heard of Augustinian. How many have heard of Pelagius? Yeah, okay, see. Most everybody's heard of Augustinian. About three have heard of Pelagius. But who won the debate? Pelagius. Pelagius won the debate. How do I know? Because once the concept was introduced that you are saved by grace, certainly, plus that opened the floodgate of what is the plus. And the plus was confess your sins to a man. The plus was take mass. The plus was buy an indulgence. The plus was burn a candle. The plus was give some money, and as soon as the coin hits the chest, the soul from purgatory is released. All of that system of religion is all built on Pelagianism. You never heard of the guy, and the whole world lives by it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then to help ourselves, what we do is don't talk about him, just hold up Augustinian saying, see, we're all, we believe we're saved by grace, and then we don't go on and say what else? The cornerstone of saved by grace is you have no free choice. Either way you go, Pelagianism makes God a tyrant. It makes God a sovereign God of the universe that's burning somebody for an eternity in purgatory until you put a coin in the box, which makes you the savior of your relative and makes the God that's keeping him there nothing more than a usurper, nothing more than a usurer, nothing more than wanting your money. Makes God a tyrant. Augustinian does the exact same thing, only a different way. You're saved by grace. Oh, yeah, thank you, God. But the caveat is, I'm making the choice who gets the grace and who doesn't get the grace. God's just as much a tyrant under Augustinianism as he is under Pelagianism. It makes God a tyrant. Where the fact of the matter is, God does say, I have, here's who I want to be saved. I want everybody to be saved. To the point, to the point that when Jesus comes, his question to you, if you're not in that kingdom, his question to you will be, what more could I have done that I have not done? That makes God a loving God who's doing everything he can to save you except cross your free choice. And if you're outside those gates, you're out there because you resisted the loving draw of God. You actively resisted it. So what happens is that the church follows these men, which leads us, if we go down to 1500, Really, it's going to be about 1,200. We go down to there. What is the condition? The condition is this, guys. The whole world is enslaved. The whole world is enslaved. What does that mean? That means spiritually, you cannot be saved unless you're attached where? To the church. So the church has fully interjected itself between the soul of an individual and the grace of God. And the church becomes the dispenser of the grace of God. It's a lie. It's always been a lie. It will always be a lie. And if you think when you're going to the door to witness that you're the dispenser of the grace of God, stay home. Stay home. 
Because all you're doing as a witness is to witness what the grace of God has done for you. And then to give the invitation that the grace of God will do that for the other person. What God has done for you, He will do for everybody. That's your witness. You're not the dispenser of it. Does that make sense? And wherever you see a church interject itself between the individual salvation and God, it is wrong. It has always been wrong, will always be wrong. And when should you resist it? The moment you see it, resist it. Because it'll never stop on its own. And once a church believes that your attachment to them has a lot to do with your eternal life, they will never cease exercising the authority and the demands upon you. They will never stop. Resist it from the very beginning. So if we see a hierarchical power entering into the Seventh-day Adventist church, we shouldn't wait for 300 years for it to fully get developed. We've already seen what the development will be. We should resist it from the day we see it. We should resist it and stand up. Does that make sense to you? I wish that I had the words to say how devastating the dark ages were. How when you got up in the morning, you lived in a shack, you lived in a hut, and you went to work on land that you did not own. And you worked from morning till night, and whatever was gathered out of there, you thought, what, I'm so grateful because, hey, I got food that I can feed my family? No, because at the end of every harvest, either robbers, kings, lords, earls, rulers, whoever it was, came through and took what the church had left because the church came through first and took everything. Then they came through and took what was left. And you were left for your entire life on starvation. No choice, fully convinced that if you had one coin left, drop it in a box, buy an indulgence, so that when you escape this life of misery, you have some chance for paradise. And that's what you were taught. To the point that you believed it yourself, which was papal infallibility. The people themselves believed that the Pope was the vicar of Christ. And then they believed in the divine right of kings. Everybody believed that the king had the right to take all of this. That you worked for, he had the right to take it. And they were regularly taught that your responsibility is to the king. And if the king is wrong, it doesn't matter. Your responsibility is to do what the king says God will deal with the king. And that's called the divine right of kings. And that's what every hierarchy is built on, either papal infallibility or the divine right of kings. Every hierarchy is built on that. And the people believe that themselves. How would you like to live there? Well, here's what the books say. Here's how that developed. The way it developed was that the gospel spread so fast. Now, Wiley will especially bring this out, and Dobbin Yeh will especially bring this out. And I'm not trying to disagree like I know more than these guys do. I don't. <clears throat> And what happened was that Christianity grew so fast. By and large, Christianity in the first hundred years, where did they meet? They met in homes. Jewish synagogues. Especially for the first 30 years, Jewish synagogues. Ultimately, they'd get put out of there too. 
But some of Paul's greatest sermons, he, he preached, he would start in a Jewish synagogue, and then you'll read where the people would come to him and say, preach the same thing to us next Sabbath. And where did they go? Down by the river. So it was outdoor church. Met in homes. You say, oh, we ought to do that. I don't know if we ought to do that or not. I'm not opposed to that, but that's not the point. The point is they couldn't have built churches fast enough to hold all the people that were coming in. Couldn't have done it. So what the historian says is that they were going so fast. Well, certainly then cities had larger populations of believers. So in the beginning, where do you think the largest population of believers were? In the beginning. So they walk out of the upper room, Jerusalem. So where was the center of Christianity? Jerusalem. And if you read uh, Great Controversy and you read uh, Desire of Ages, you're going to find out, and or, I mean Acts of the Apostles, you're going to find out that that became the center to a fault. They had so much success in Jerusalem that they no longer felt the need to go out beyond Jerusalem to do anything. So what God do? Sent in persecution and drove them out there to take the gospel to the world. That's what happened. But Jerusalem becomes a center. Well, I'm over here in Nazareth and we're having a church group and we're having a difficulty and we're having a discussion and uh, you're, you're kind of thinking we shouldn't be eating meat and I'm kind of thinking it doesn't make any difference. And so this discussion is going on and pretty soon we involve David in the discussion. Then pretty soon we involve Doug in the discussion. Then pretty soon, has anybody ever seen a discussion like that happen in the church? Until you know it, the church is just divided right down the middle. Well, those kind of things begin to happen. And so what they would do would be they would send a representative to Jerusalem and they would ask for advice from the experienced leaders in Jerusalem. Can you help us solve this problem? Is that a bad thing to do? No, that's not a bad thing to do. So people from Jerusalem would come, sit down, and help them to solve the problem. Then over there, there'd be another problem. So that basically, if I can remember now, got to be five centers. I'll probably only get four of them. Somebody will help me. Let's go. Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Rome, and I forget. Well, that was a region, and the city may have been there, but, those, but there were five centers. And then what developed is asking for advice. Do you know what the problem in asking people for advice? Here, here's the problem. If you ask me for advice once, you get advice. And then you thank me, hug me, kiss me, pat me on the back, and say, man, you're the smartest guy we ever know. Do you know how that makes me feel? It feels good, kind of gives me a high as I drive home. Whew! And I get home, and then Gail says, how's it go? And I say, you know, it's just amazing. It turned out that I didn't know this, but I'm the smartest, wisest guy that the world has ever seen. And they, they just said, I'm wonderful. And guess what I want tomorrow? And by the time you ask me for advice the tenth time, you're no longer asking. Because I'm saying you don't make a move until you ask me for permission. And advice moves to permission. And let permission go for a while, then permission goes to demand. And let demand go for a while, and demand will go to death decree. And that's exactly what happened to the early church. From giving advice, they went to giving permission. And they begin to see that they were the ones who were governing the church. And the church began to feel we can't function without them governing. And Jesus disappeared and the power of the church disappeared. And then we started building church buildings because the people weren't coming in so fast that we couldn't handle it anymore. And that's exactly what happened. When you ask the elder for advice, 
be sure he understands. Advice is never becoming permission. Amen. Understand that. And parents, when your kids ask you for advice, be sure your advice never becomes permission. Because your permission will ultimately end up in a demand. And your demand will ultimately end up in a death decree and you will sever every relationship you have with your kids. And there could be people in this room who have done that very thing. Then back up and move back to advice. Do you understand what I'm saying? So then there became a war between these five locations which ultimately boiled down to three. Jerusalem, Rome, Alexandria. And those became the centers for church government. And ultimately, that boiled down to one. And that was Rome. And that fully then established the papacy. Now you say, Dean, is, is this all important? You take all this, is that important? Well, it is because, guys, we teach this every, every evangelistic series. We teach this. We just don't do it in the way I'm doing it. But what we teach is this. The church in Jerusalem in A.D. 30 was called what? According to Revelation chapter 2. Ephesus. Has anybody ever heard of that? And then there's a description of what Ephesus is. And what was the problem in Ephesus? You have forgot your first love. Who means they forgot who? Jesus. Now we understand what was happening. How did they forget Jesus? Because men were arising among the church who were leading people after themselves. And they became prominent. So the people forgot Jesus. Then the next church, right? And I'm not going to give you a quick test to ask you to go through all seven, but we teach this. We teach this as a timeline and a history of the church that ends in 2017. As of right now, the book of Revelation is still pick, speaking to us. What church are we in? Laodicea. And what is the issue in Laodicea? We don't need anything. Problem number one. What's problem number two? We do not see ourselves as we are. Poor, blind, and naked. Do you understand? So Revelation is still speaking to us. We are in a failing position. Are we going to be saved as a Laodicean church? The answer is no. But, the, but there is no church after Laodicea. So what happens? The church is woken up. Ellen White will put it in these terms. That the church militant is what we are right now. She'll use that word. We are the church militant. But we'll become what? The church victorious. And we turn to our first love. And the circle will have been completed. That when Christ comes, His church will will be in the upper room experience of one accord, filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed by the seal of God, saying, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for Him. That's where we're going to end up. But darkness was ruling the earth. Gross was that darkness. A time of trouble since the world had not seen, according to Matthew chapter 24. 50 million people, guys. 50 million. That's staggering. Then something happened. It was miraculous. <laughs> the danger in proceeding forward is I do not want, when we talk about certain men, the goal is not to exalt these men. But something happened. Oh, I, I do need to give a side note because I'm taking the history of the church 
and going through a certain channel. But if you read The Great Controversy and you read Daubigny and you read Wiley, they're going to give a, a, a little sidetrack, but we don't know much about the sidetrack. Because the church began to divide. And let me tell you, the majority of the church is going down the channel I'm talking about. But what did happen? There was a group of people. They were called the Waldensians. Now, people will say, well, we can, well, wait a minute, we can trace the Waldensians back to Waldo. No, 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 that's not true. Waldensians can be traced much further back than that because believers ended up in the Alps and they ended up in the valleys and they ended up in the mountains and there the truth of the gospel was still taught. Now, we don't know much about them. There's not much recorded except here's what we do know. Uh, just before what I'm about to describe, uh, Waldensian young people, which would mean probably we're thinking around 15, 16, 17, they did one of two things. First, for the first 15 years of their life, they were taught strict discipline. Strict discipline. And you say, oh, so that's what their parents did? No, that's the harshness of the work they had to do. Hard work teaches discipline. Has anybody ever noticed that? Hard work teaches discipline. And they lived under the harshest conditions. And they learned discipline. Secondly, they memorized scripture. Whole books and passages they memorized. And that shaped their hearts to the point that the love of God was living brightly in them because it says that no greater love can a man have than he would lay his life down for a friend. And those 15, 16 year olds would be selected by their parents and other leaders in those valleys. And they would leave those valleys, they would give their final hug, never to be seen again. And what they would do would be they would take trade wares, sew scriptures into their clothes, and they would begin to journey, and wherever they were journeyed, they would find somebody who was interested, and at night, quietly, they would then share what they had memorized, and that's the only way the word of God was ever spread was through these young people. And they would just go until they were caught. Once they were caught, they would be butchered. And if you want to know how, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. They would tear them from limb to limb. And they would never be seen or heard of again. And next year, do you know what would happen? parents would select the next 15-year-old, kiss them goodbye, and send them on their way. I am telling you, stop babying your 15-year-olds. They are the ones who can do the work that we have refused to do. Hug them, kiss them, let them know you love them, then send them to martyrdom that they may gain a crown of righteousness for an eternity. Amen. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will what? Will gain it. So those, that's what the church was doing there. But along around the early 1200 mark, what would happen would be this man would appear. He would ultimately be called the morning star of the Reformation. And Wycliffe, you, you've heard of him, right? Without this man, there would never have been a George Washington. But it never happened. And I'm going to give you a history that is true, but you'll never get it anywhere else. And that is this. Civil liberty never produces religious liberty. Never. We only saw ourselves free when men saw themselves free in God. 
It's religious liberty that produces civil liberty. Never for a moment say, I live in a country that gives me religious freedom. Forget it. This country doesn't give anybody religious freedom. God gives religious freedom. And living in Russia has as much religious freedom as you have in the United States. And I can live in Syria and have as much religious freedom as I have in the United States. It's just in another country I may have to pay a penalty for that. But I have it. And make no mistake about it. And the General Conference doesn't grant me religious freedom. The Lord God of heaven has given it, ratified it in the blood of Jesus Christ, and has given that and stamped that on my soul, and I give credit to no man or group of men for that stamp. Only praise to God. And if my last breath is to be tied to a stake, I pray that my last breath will be, thank you, God, for freedom to make a choice. And that's why a man named John Huss, when they were getting ready to tie him to the stake, I read the account, it was a hot day, the guards who were guarding him were sweating, they put him in the hottest place before the fire because they were trying to torture him. And he turns to those guards and he says, there's shade right there, there's water right there, go sit in the shade, get water. I am not moving, I'm not here because of you, I'm here because of my own choice. Today is not your day, today is my day. And then when they lit him on fire, what did he say? Jesus Have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. And the last words out of John Huss's mouth were, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Wow. Well, Wycliffe comes along. He's in England. I'm sorry, I get stirred up. But doesn't it stir your soul? So Wycliffe comes along and he says, uh, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. So he goes to Mass and he confesses his sins and he comes home and guess what? He feels wretched, blind. He feels awful. No salvation. And he goes through the darkest time of his life pleading and it's just total darkness around him. And he goes to the church and he goes to the church and he goes to the church and he does this and he does that. And he's just searching, searching, searching. He's never even seen a Bible. And finally, he finds some scripture. And you know what he does? He learns Greek. He learns Hebrew just so he can read the scripture. He learns Latin so he can read the scripture. And then he begins to read the scripture and all of a sudden a light comes into his soul. And what does he realize? He realizes for the first time in his life that he is saved by grace, by the blood of Christ alone. And no man has any part of that, even himself. And he came to the knowledge of Jesus only. That was his first great truth. His second great truth, that when he read in the Bible and it enlightened his soul that he was saved by Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, guess what the next truth he comes to is? the importance of the scriptures. And that ultimately would become a name. Do you know what that name is? And that became the next truth he came to. 
Now, what does sola scripture mean? The Bible and the Bible only. And I'll deal more with that. But then when he had the Bible and the Bible only, he came to the third great truth. And I'm going quickly because I, I can give more detail to this and I will. But what's the great next great truth that he comes to? Thank you very much. Priesthood of all believers. Each one of these has profound implications. Profound implications. Jesus only. Guys, that's hugely profound. Without that, there would have been no Reformation. And whoever teaches that there was a Reformation because Protestants rose up and persecuted Catholicism is lying to you. But that is what is commonly taught. I can read that to you right here. It's commonly taught. There would have been no Protestant. The first time the word Protestant used was used around 1531 at a council when the protest of the princes took place against Charles V. First time the word Protestant was used. What started the Reformation was an individual who realized under the burden guilt of sin, no peace in his heart, afraid to die, because if I die, I will seek lower than hell, never to come back again. Felt the wondrous news of the love of Jesus Christ, that God is a loving Savior and has forgiven all of my sins and cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness and has said, if I confess my sins, He will forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And John Wycliffe said, I stand free before God. Amen. And that started a movement in England which would then start a Reformation. Now, just one interesting thing about John Wycliffe is this. There, if you read this, this is very clear. Do you know where the document came from that becomes, in history, the loud cry of the masses of people, freedom from the king? It's a document called the Magna Carta. Have you ever heard of that? The Magna Carta flowed out of people who accepted these three teachings. There would have been no Magna Carta without the teachings of John Wycliffe. And there would have been no constitution and declaration of independence if there hadn't have been a Magna Carta. This country can trace its freedom directly back to John Wycliffe. This man set the world free by proclaiming Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, he was hated by most everybody. And he was on his deathbed. And he was dying. And the church leaders said, now's our chance. So they came to the deathbed of uh, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe. They came to his deathbed. He was laying there, hardly breathing, breathing his last. It's a very interesting story. They go into this room and these monks and leaders all gather around him and say, John Wycliffe, you're dying. They were so happy. Oh, they held their hands right. Be cautious of people who hold their hands right and bow. You know, they give you that look and you, your heart just melts. And they just bless. And they give you speeches on, let's all be kind here today. Let's treat each other rightly today. Be cautious of all that because I'm telling you, behind the scenes, they're doing everything but that. I know I'm being plain. But praise God for these monks. They saved Wycliffe's life. They came in and they said, John, you're dying. This is it. 
you can already feel the fires of purgatory. This is your last chance. Just say, forgive me, and we will forgive you and send you straight to paradise. What was that? John, could you just speak a little louder? No. And this is what he said. You think I'm dying? I'm not dying. And he pulled himself up in bed and said, I'm getting out of this bed and I'm dealing a death blow to you. Get out of here. And the men holding their hands right and using a soft tone of voice and doing all their... all fled out of there. John Wycliffe got out of bed, went over his desk, sat down, and did the greatest work of his life. And he translated the Bible into English. It wasn't a great translation, but it was far more than they had. And when he laid that quill pen down and closed the book, he laid down and died. They hated him so much that about 40 years, 50 years later, it was a little more than that, sorry, I'm not getting that right, but when they got William Tyndall, who gave a much better translation of the Bible, when they burned William Tyndall at the stake, they said, let's take care of this problem once and for all. And they went and dug up John Wycliffe, brought him over to the fire of William Tyndall, burned him too. John Wycliffe, morning star of the Reformation. Do you find that interesting and important? A little later, there was a man who was named Huss, John Huss, and he had a friend, Jerome, and they were in Bohemia, and John Huss went through an experience. Do you know what his experience was? He wanted to go to heaven, but he was surrounded in darkness. And he would plead with God. He would plead, oh, I want to be saved, I want to be saved. So he'd go, and he'd go to Mass, and he would go to confession, and he would make pilgrim, he would do journeys, he would do all these things, and yet there was a darkness around his soul. Until John Huss did what? He read the Bible for the first time, and guess what he discovered? And John Huss became the mightiest preacher of his day proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he discovered that in the scriptures that was against the law for him to read, as he discovered that, the scriptures, guess what's the next truth he came to? Are you beginning to see something? then guess what's the next truth he came to? Which has profound implication. And I already told you the death experience of John Huss, right? Uh, just for uh, information, after John Huss died, they burned him at the stake. They thought, we won. That's the mistake the devil always, mistake, always makes. He is so stupid. <laughs> now, he's smarter than you, which makes you what? <laughs> when the person who's the most stupid person in the universe is smarter than me, what's that make me? You say, Dean, how can you say that the devil is stupid? 
because he, for how, we don't know how long, stood right next to the throne of God, could co- talk to God daily, and believed that God was mean. Now how you can look at the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Bible says if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? How you can stand right there and look at Jesus Christ and walk away with the conclusion, God's a tyrant, I'm going to start my own government, you're stupid. And I can't explain it, hence mystery of iniquity. I can't explain it. But John Huss, they thought we got him, we killed him. But you know how they killed him, right? They gave him a safe conduct to come to appear before the council. So he comes with the safe conduct. And the safe conduct does not prove you innocent. The safe conduct just says, no matter how we find you, this pass allows you to go back where you started from free. But the moment your foot touches that, then we can kill you. That's what a safe conduct meant. It was sacred because a king would pledge his word. And so the king pledged his word. John Huss took his safe conduct, come to the council, The Pope told the king, we've declared him a heretic. No agreements need to be kept with heretics. The safe conduct doesn't apply. They took him out, burned him at the stake, as I described. That so infuriated Bohemia that their son, who was the bright spot of their nation, was so dishonored and burned under that false pretense that Bohemia went to arms. And they chose a general, and his name was Zika or something like that. It starts with a Z. His difficulty was he was blind. Couldn't see. So here's the first battle. Six, uh, maybe 50, 50,000 Crusaders are sent into Bohemia. They are met by 15,000 Bohemians led by this blind general. What would you suggest the outcome's about to be? 50,000 to six or 15,000, and there is no long range artillery. The end of the day, in the initial assault, 15,000 crusaders were killed. The estimate is about 90% of the army was destroyed by the day over. The Bohemians lost 35 men. 35. So they decided, let's do another battle. So they did the next battle. And they sent an army in, and it was about 80. And it was met met with about 40,000 Bohemians, same result. Only they gathered all the wealth of the crusaders because they dropped everything and got rich. But then the general died and they thought, now we've got it because the general died. Hierarchies always make this mistake. You can't beat a free people. It's an impossibility. Because hierarchies are built on the concept, get rid of the head, and you got everybody else. And every hierarchy, dictatorial, you see around the world, that's exactly the way it works. Get rid of the leader, you get everybody else, you get the whole nation. But you come to a free people and you cut off the leader's head, what do you got? You got everybody else to deal with. Because everybody's standing here by their choice, not because that guy said stand here. I'm standing there by choice. You cannot defeat free people. And that's what Jesus has done. He set us free. We're unstoppable. We're unbeatable. The only thing anybody can do is kill us. So what? There's a resurrection. And if you kill me, you got got my son to deal with. And if you kill him, you got him to deal with. Because why? Because we're all standing here by choice. So they say, we got them now, so they sent 100,000. But they had another general, and his name starts with a P, and I forget it. I'm not too good at Bohemian. 
and, and its names appear a little longer than this other general's name, and they got there, and he had about 60,000 men, and they lined up for battle. The crusader said, this is it, we've got these guys. The battle didn't even start until the crusaders all threw down their weapons and ran for home as fast as they could. And in history, it's just unexplainable. There was no battle fought. The bohemians just went up and gathered up all the wealth, all the carts, all the food, all the weapons, took them back. So the Roman legate or the representative of the pope said, oh, well, I know what the problem is. They needed me there. Because when I'm there, they won't run because they'll look at me and be full of courage. So they brought 120,000 again. And again, it's about 40,000. There's a river in between them. And all the Bohemians are lined up. And that mass array of people. And they look upon the hill and there's that league that's standing in that vis visible to everybody. The battle is getting ready to start. And nobody understands why. It's a mystery in, he, in, in, in history. It's a mystery. That legate became terrified on his horse, turned around, took off, and the whole 120,000 army went with him. They won. But not ultimately. Because ultimately, the Bohemians went into a council. Rome called a council and said, look, it's obvious we see different things, but let's just make peace. And let's just make peace that you believe what you want to believe and we'll believe what we want to believe and let us coexist. And you let us teach in your lands and live safely among you and there will be peace. We'll never come again and they made the compromise, and there's a name to that compromise. Then you know what happened? Now what you're gonna say is, well, they came in, taught, and 50 years later, they're gone. No, the Bohemians divided. Because that general said, we can't let them into our lands. Hasn't history taught us anything? Do you know what they're gonna do when they come into our lands? They're gonna rob us, they're gonna steal us, they're gonna make us poverty stricken, they're gonna take away the word of God from us. Do you not know what they did with John Huss? They're going to do to us. So then the Bohemians fought. And uh, the general and his group lost. And the rest of the Bohemians made the compromise. And this is what the Pope's comment on it was. The Pope said, It's true. The only way you can defeat a Bohemian is to get a Bohemian to fight a Bohemian. It's true saying, the only way you can defeat a Bohemian is to get a Bohemian to fight a Bohemian. And the saying is still true today. The only way you could get a Seventh-day Adventist defeated is to get a Seventh-day Adventist to fight a Seventh-day Adventist. And that is exactly what's happening among us. And it's being done intentionally get out of the fights Amen. love each other Amen. Christ alone scripture alone priesthood of all believers stand on that Amen. stand on that platform of truth Ellen White says in early writings that she had a vision that at the end she saw people in the church get off of the platform of truth. Have you read that? To examine the pillars that that platform was standing on. Those are the pillars the platform of truth stands on. They examined those pillars and said they're not needed. That's, that's in early writing. That is happening. That prophecy is being fulfilled right now. You say, Dean, I, I don't believe that's happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, I'll give you an example of it, and tomorrow I'll give you more examples of it. Do you know when we got a church manual? Uh, 
Yeah, it was about 1920, 1921. We got our first church manual. Do you know how long we discussed a church manual? From the 1800s. About 1890 or so, at the general conference, they brought up the issue of church manual every time Ellen White and others voted against it. They did not get, we did not get a church manual till after Ellen White died. Do you know why she voted against the church manual? She said, we are people of the Bible. If we need an answer, spend time with the Bible. Amen. And if your church needs an answer, then all of you get on your knees, spend time with the Bible. Amen. Ask God. If you vote this manual, there will come a day when the manual will be equal or higher than the Bible. And you will turn to the manual before you turn to God. And that's exactly what's happening among us. Church boards. The manual, is the manual is advice, and that is all. But what does advice do? Becomes permission. And what does permission become? Demand. And what does demand become? Death decree. And most often, in our arguments, somebody's going to say, what's the church manual say? Where she says what? I think what you would have to do is start reading general conference bulletins when she was still alive. And that's not a huge task because they didn't have them regularly. And just start reading her comments in the general conference bulletins and you'll come to that. <clears throat> take it as advice take it as advice I know hey I've been doing this a long time <laughs> take it as advice it's not wrong to ask for advice just don't let advice move to permission. Because it will never stop until it ends in a death decree. Ever. Well, then we come to this man right here. And then Melanchthon. And that was about 1512. And you know, other than Jesus Christ, this man has more books written on him in Western civilization than anybody else. Melanchthon. Nope. But at 1030, when I let everybody go, if you want to come up here, I can find it real quick. Now, this is going to be much more familiar to you, so let me just go through this quickly. What was it that Martin Luther wanted? Salvation. What, what happened to him? Tell me his story. You know his story. So quickly tell me what happened to him. Oh, not yet. That guy almost, except the grace of God, spared his life, almost killed himself whipped himself, starved himself, beat himself, did everything, everything to gain peace. And what happened? No peace, no peace, no peace. Joined the church. He was a brilliant man. His dad had big plans for him. And then he just disappeared into a monastery and his family was just so upset. His friends couldn't understand it. He disappeared. They'd find him laying bloody in his cell. And when they came to wake him up, Martin Luther wasn't there. Where's Luther at? They'd go, and there he'd be laying bloody in his cell from beating himself. No peace. It was just a cry of despair in the darkness of his own soul, pleading with God, but I need mercy. He gave penance. He, he did masses. He did confessions. He became a priest so he could experience the salvation of God. And all he got was just darkness, death, afraid to die. And then one day, guess what he found? Read 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it was a growing concept in his mind. Along that time, he takes a journey. These are true stories, guys. Uh, people make movies out of them, but they're true stories. He goes to Rome. He's disgusted with the evil he sees in Rome. He said Rome, which he thought going to Rome, he said Rome, the eternal city, Rome, where the seed of God is. I journeyed there to look, and when I stood on those mountains overlooking Rome, I realized that Rome was built over hell. But he went there, and he did so many masses, and he did so many penances, and then on that staircase flown by angels, Pilate's staircase that angels flew over, to, flew over to Rome, and we believe that. He's walking up those steps on his knees, kissing each step, because each step is cutting off so many years in purgatory, and he's praying, and all of a sudden, what happens? You are saved by grace alone. And he stood up on those stairs and said, that's it. And he walked off those stairs and he walked into eternity and was born the Reformation. What was his next great truth? What was the next truth? And then 500 years ago, October 31, he went to a door and he nailed 95 theses on that door. His goal was to reform the church. His goal was to reform the church. His goal was to have an open discussion. Do you know what Wycliffe's goal was? To reform the church. Do you know what Huss's goal was? To reform the church and this is where I'm going to end do you know where each of these men ended yeah. oh they, all, they did Wycliffe he died naturally they burned him later Luther died naturally uh, <clears throat> the only thing they did to Luther was to proclaim uh, 480 years later the reformation is over we've all come home do you know what they all ended, guys? Do you know? Now this is going to be where I'm going to end, and I'll pick it up tomorrow. And if you're going to get mad at me, now's the time. <laughs> they all realized there was no reforming the church. So the Reformation started with these three teachings. With the realization you can't reform the church, which began the loud cry of come out of her my people, which would become the number one message of proclamation for the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. These three teachings produce a loud cry of come out of her my people, there is no reforming the church. And here's why. Then I'll be done. The pitfall for divine right of kings, I've already explained that in a sentence. The pitfall for divine right of kings was everybody believed divine right of kings was okay. What was the problem? What did I need? Somebody say it loud. I needed a good king. And if I had a good king who cared for everybody, no problem with divine right of kings. I needed a new good king. What did the founders of our country come to? There is no good king. It's an impossibility. And you say, Dean, how do you know that? Because Jesus Christ himself said to the rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? 
There is none good but God. You can never find a king who doesn't need salvation as much as you do. Who is as broken as you are. There is no good king. And our founders said, because of these three teachings and these forerunners setting us free of the gospel, George Washington and those men say, we're not in search of a good king. There is no good king. We are free men. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. No good king. And for the first time in history, when a man was approached that said the revolution is falling apart, uh, Mr. Washington, let us proclaim you king for a period of time until we establish the republic and then you'll be gone. Do you know that man who had pledged everything for the establishment of this country? I don't care what history calls him now, slave owner, they call him this, they call him that. That man said, and you know who they sent to ask him? John Knox, his best friend. General Knox came to him and pled with him, George, you need to become king. That so enraged George Washington that said, do you not even know who I am? All men are free, and now you ask me what I have spent everything on. My wealth, my reputation, my family, my health. You have asked me to now give that all up and proclaim myself king. He would not talk to that guy ever again. I've read the letters that John Knox wrote to him. He begged him four times. Please forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing before George Washington would ever talk to him again. Why do we get a George Washington? Because we had a Martin Luther. And how did we get a Martin Luther? Because we had a Jesus Christ. And because we have the Scriptures. And because we have a priesthood of all believers and God implanted in those men's heart, we refuse to rule over other men. Amen. We refuse it. And the Reformation was born and tomorrow we will be, deal with Zwingli. But you already know, so you can skip the first 15 minutes because what's the first truth that Zwingli's going to come to? <laughs> Now here's what becomes important. Wycliffe did not teach Huss. How did Wycliffe get it? Study of the scriptures. How did Huss get it? And you say, how do you know? Because I have a written statement from Huss that said later on when he read Wycliffe's writings, he said, I'm so glad to have read these writings of John Wycliffe that confirms the truth I've been led to. Huss did not teach Luther. Where did Luther get it? There comes a day when the Bible says that no man will be taught by another man. How will we be taught? By the Word of God. What we as Seventh-day Adventists need now more than anything else is to move back to become people of the book. The study of the scriptures to the truth that Jesus alone is our Savior will create in us a priesthood of all believers that will become an army filled with love for each other that will become unstoppable to the billions on this earth. Have a good day.